Amen. Genesis chapter 1, we have the famous creation account. We have what's commonly called the creation week. Now, before the service, during Sunday school, I had asked Sister Angela, I, she said, yes, yeah, six days God created everything. And I said, what did God create on the seventh day? And she said, rest. Amen. That's the right answer. God rested. He gave us the day off. And there's a pattern there that we ought, we ought to take a day and rest and learn to uh, have some peace and uh, kind of re reinvigorate ourselves. Uh, I want to talk this morning about how the creation account, the creation week that we have in Genesis chapter 1, is history. This is literal history, 24-hour periods Seven days in the week, six of those days, God was creating things for the first time, and that doctrine is under attack. There are even so-called Christians today, so-called Christians, now most of them preach a false gospel, they preach out of a false Bible, and they'll tell you that the creation account is not true. They, sometimes, they, they try to blend God and evolution together, and the result is just simply confusion. It's not right. It's not accurate. And they want to reference other sources than God's Word. And they want to take uh, some critic that didn't believe God, and they want to change God's Word, and they want to change history. So we're going to talk a little bit about this creation week. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the Bibles that attack or criticize creation week. Right here in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 3 and you see Satan introduced, he says, Yea, hath God said. The first thing he says is, Did God really say that? So the devil wants to cause you to doubt and disbelieve what God has already said and what he's established. Here in Genesis 1.1, it's very clear. He says, God created the heaven and the earth. All the Bibles that are critical of the truth, they change this to read the heavens, plural, and the earth, which makes it a contradiction. If you notice my chart this morning, it says the sky and the space, which are also called heavens, were created on day two. However, the other Bibles say, no, all the heavens were created on day one, thereby make a, making a contradiction right away. If you're ever on vacation and you're in a hotel and, you, and you're, uh, you, know, you see one of those Gideon Bibles, and you, well, I wonder what version it is. Well, pick it up. Go to Genesis 1.1. If they turn heaven into plural, heavens, then it makes the Bible a contradiction. It's the easiest way to tell. Very important doctrine. One letter can change everything. Okay? Very important. So, remember that. Uh, I want you to see something. If you would go to uh, Colossians chapter 1 in the New Testament. We'll be right back in Genesis. Go to Colossians chapter number 1. Uh, God did everything in order. He is a God of order. And God created the first heaven, His dwelling place. And now, the Bible calls it the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, it's called paradise in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, it's, interest, it's an interesting concept that God created where the angels would be first and where the people would be. And then on the second day, He began to create the sky and the space. He was creating the, the atmosphere, the cosmos, the different layers in between. After the fact, He begins to separate. As you're going to Colossians 1, let me read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. It says, "...and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that Jesus is your creator, He's your savior, He's your redeemer. And this is an important doctrine that Jesus is the one that spoke things into existence, that created things. He actually made you, He made your soul. This is very, very important doctrine. You're in Colossians chapter 1. This is speaking of the Son of God. It tells us that we, it's through His blood that we're saved. We get the forgiveness of sins. In verse 15 it says, "...who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature." Verse 16, "...for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him." and for Him. 
Now go to John chapter 1. I just want to review this real quick, that in the New Testament it's clear that Jesus is our Creator. Uh, he deserves the preeminence above all. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is important. He is your Creator. And He did everything in less than a week. He did it in six literal days. These are not symbolic days. These are not figurative days. Uh, as you know, most pagan cultures, they have some weird, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a turtle carried the world on its back, or evolution would say that uh, there was a rock, and it rained on the rock for billions of years until it turned into slime. And then that primordial soup, some bacteria, some single-cell organisms began to grow, and then they changed, and then they morphed, and then they evolved. And uh, here came a little tadpole that became a snake, and it crawled on the shore and grew some limbs. The only problem is, where's Mr. Tadpole and Mrs. Tadpole? Don't you need two to reproduce? But you know how the story goes in evolution. It's so far-fetched. It blows my mind that anybody with any intellect would believe it. I believe by faith that God is my Creator. It makes sense. We're all born with the light in us. Jesus Christ is that true light. We're told in John chapter 1 that lighteth the whole world. But He tells us in John chapter 3 that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So people are often looking for excuses to discredit and discount God. They, they don't want to believe what He has said. You're in John chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Jesus is your Creator. Jesus is God. He is your Savior. This is foundational doctrine. It's very important. The world wants to attack that. The devil wants to discredit that. And it's very important for us to understand this biblical truth, as it says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. That would be there's no mountains and there's no valleys or there's no caves, no voids, right? There was, it was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. You say, where did I come from? Well, about 6,000 years ago, God spoke all things into existence. On one day, He created the heaven and the earth. On another day, He created man and his wife on the same day. This is super important doctrine that's under attack. Notice in day one, there's a few things God created. It's the heaven and the earth. It's the dark and also the light. It's the dirt and also uh, the water. It's the deep and the void. He created good. He created division. But most importantly, He created day and night. As Brother Doug pointed out in Sunday school hour, that God created light on the first day, separate of the sun, moon, and stars that He would do three days later on that fourth day. This is important. God is the origin of light. Uh, Jesus said, are, are there not 12 hours in the day. What does that mean? Well, I've got 12 hours of light. That's called the day. I've got 12 hours of dark. That's called the night. The evening came first. The evening and the morning were the first day. So uh, that's how God did things. Now, God could have, He could have all done it in one split second, couldn't He have? Amen. Does anybody agree with that? If God wanted to, He could have just said, and there it all is, and here we all are, completely created with families and everything. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, they were both created at the same time, if he wanted. But he's a God of order and also significance. He's trying to teach us something. He's putting order to everything that we do so we can better understand who he is. Now, there are some Bibles that attack this. I, I do want to point out, if there's a pattern in Genesis 1. I like patterns. There's a neat one in Genesis 1, 9, or Psalm 119. We'll, we'll do that one day, but that's a long chapter, right? Uh, there's a pattern here. It's the word and. He starts off by saying, in the beginning. 
He tells you what he did, and then he says, and, in verse 2, in the middle of verse 2, and, darkness. In verse 3, and God said. Verse 4, and God saw. Middle of verse 4, and God divided. Verse 5, and God called, and the darkness he called, and the evening and the morning. You get the pattern. Uh, and, 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 and. Did you notice that almost all the verses here start with the, with the word and? Do you know why? This is a single account. This is God giving you His historical record. It's one continuing thought. It's the creation week. And it's God giving us that account right here just in one shot. And I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and I did that. He didn't stop for anything. He didn't take a breath. He's trying to tell us everything He did all at once. Now what's interesting, we studied, we talked about this over the past two weeks, so those of you that weren't here, I'll catch you up on this. We spake of two particular men, Westcott and Hort. There's only two Bibles out there. There's the authorized version only crowd, or there's the Westcott and Hort only crowd. The Westcott and Hort, these two scholars, so-called, they were Darwinist evolutionists. Uh, they were two real anti-Christ figures. One was a communist, the other one was a Darwinist. And they criticize the Bible. They use the Antioch, or I'm sorry, the Alexandrian texts. And again, I don't want to go over your head. Let me just give you a brief summary. I want you to understand there's two Bibles. I don't care if it's a New King James, an RSV, an NLT, a Legacy Standard Bible, a Young's Literal Translation. We can go right on down the list. There's over 400 of them in the last 100 years. They all come from these Westcott and Hort Bibles. They're Catholic Bibles. It was the source for what was known as the RV. The AV is the authorized version, the revised version. They wanted to revise what was there and change it. Why? Well, they didn't like some things. They didn't like that it said you had to believe on Jesus to get baptized. They want to baptize babies. And there's many examples of verses that they deleted. So these two guys, communist, Darwinist, they were Bible correctors. Their primary two texts were called the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. These are partial copies of Bibles. They had 5,000 copies over here, and they said, well, we've got these two that are slightly different, so we need to add to or change the 5,000. The Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, they were corruptions. They were the uh, Alexandrius mystical texts. There were things that were changed. Uh, here's a quote where they said that nearly every page there was a correction or an omission. Something was changed or modified. Uh, there's um, Tischendorf counted 14,800 errors in them. That's pretty big. And then those two texts that they stand on, there's over 4,000 contradictions in the Gospels alone. This is a bad source. This is not a good Bible. If I handed you a Bible and it was clear that somebody had erased the page and rewritten it in a different handwriting, a different font, a different text, a different pen, a different ink, you'd probably say, wait a minute, are you trying to pull a fast one on me? This doesn't make sense. There were also many misspellings and grammatical errors and omitted lines of scriptures. Okay? So these false Bibles that are out in the world today, many of them attack the creation record. And we've been talking about the Bibles. Last week I had a big old stack of Bibles and we went through them and I showed some doctrine that was changed. Um, but these two guys, Westcott and Hort, they did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. That means they're not a Christian. They did not believe that Genesis 1 through 3 should be in the Bible. They don't believe the uh, creation record. They believe in Darwin. Um, they didn't believe that the Garden of Eden existed. They don't believe that Jesus did any miracles. They don't believe there's really a heaven or a hell. They created uh, two satanic clubs called the Hermes Club and the Ghostly Guild. You can look all this up, okay? I know I'm just throwing information at you. I want to know what we're, where, what we're up against. The source of what these guys did has infected many Bibles. And we're just going to look at a couple this morning. Um, I, I want you to, again, I want you to understand. Jesus created everything in six literal 24-hour days. Amen? Amen? Amen. Do you agree with that? He did it all. Well, these guys don't believe so. Where we get the Ten Commandments is Exodus 20. In Exodus 20, verse 11, it says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. In Exodus 31, he says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, 
And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So the Bible's clear. It was six days that God did everything. It wasn't billions of years. And there was, there's no getting out of it. This doctrine is clear. It was six literal days. Now here's the problem. From a pagan perspective, there's this occult origins of a doctrine that attacks it. Uh, there's a book called the Kabbalah. Very wicked and perverse. That, along with the Babylonian Talmud, teaches that there was a mystical world before creation week. Now, God says in the beginning, and he means in the beginning. So when you look at our chart up here, uh, on day one, God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning. There's no space before it, and there's no creation after it. He did it all in six days. He's made this clear out of the mouth of two or three witnesses by the verses I've just read for you. However, the pagans, through the Kabbalah, they teach there is no creation week. They teach that Lucifer and his wife Lilith were in another world, and they ruled the world for a, for a while until God destroyed it. That's bizarre, okay? That's not in the Bible anywhere. The problem is, Westcott and Hort brought these doctrines into Christianity. And I'm here to warn you, we need to reject these doctrines. They brought it into the modern Bibles. The NASB changes this. The YLT, it changes this. This was initially known as the ruin restoration, creation. Or it's more commonly known today as the gap theory. That God stopped and there was another world. And what they teach is in Genesis 1, if you look at it, verse number 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then right there before verse 2, they teach there was billions and billions and billions of years and there was another civilization, and there was another earth, and Lucifer used to be in charge. That's what they teach. Do you see that in your Bible? Would that be a contradiction to Exodus 20.11 when God said in six days He created everything? It would. This is important. I want you to know the origin of this pagan doctrine. Verse 2, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This theory is that God created things in between and then recreated it. The problem is, if you're really a linguistic scholar, the language simply does not support renovation or recreation or remade. Those words aren't there. That's not what they mean. I have the uh, John Nelson Darby Bible translation here. And he has a lot of interesting things that he intentionally changed, influenced by Westcott and Hort. It says in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Aha! We've found corruption already in verse 1. What about verse 2? And the earth was waste and empty. Waste? Now, wait a minute. Yours says without form and void. Everything that God made, it was good. good. Let's try that again. Everything that God made, it was good. very good. In fact, he says by the time he gets to the end of the week. So here he says it was waste. Do you know what waste is? That is, I mean, that's a, a used tissue, right? God didn't use a tissue and throw it. Well, you know, that's waste. God didn't create waste. The John Nelson Darby Bible intentionally misrepresents the creation record because he was part of a secret society. John Nelson Darby was a Calvinist. He's also what's called a fatalist. A fatalist is somebody that says you have zero choices, there is no free will. If you're here this morning, you are a robot. God forced you to get up and get dressed and get in the car and drive here. You had zero say-so in it whatsoever. Now, I don't believe that. I believe you have free will, you have choice. Well, John Nelson Darby did not believe that, and he attacked the creation, he criticized the creation record. Let me give you a, another interesting Bible. This is called the Messianic Jewish Family Bible, also known as the Tree Life Aversion. This Bible claims to go back to the Hebrew after searching the sages of the ages. All right, what do you mean? Well, they go to all the worldly so-called 
Jewish-speaking influences, which, by the way, uh, Hebrew was a dead language for 2,000 years, and it was revived by a Yiddish-speaking Ukrainian that had some Yiddish-speaking friends that were German or Russian or Ukrainian, and they all got together in the late 1800s, and they said, let's revive this language. Now, the problem is they spoke Yiddish, and they put that Yiddish spin on Hebrew. Okay, so the Hebrew that's spoken today is not the same Hebrew that we find in the Bible. Genesis chapter number 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Aha! I found the infection there too. And the earth. Now the earth was chaos and waste. Darkness was on the surface of the deep, and the Ruach Elohim was hovering upon the surface of the water. Okay, we got some major changes in this one here. Uh, the Tree of Life version, they manipulate it to say it was chaos and waste. Now, when God said, let there be light, when God began to create things, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, do you see any chaos there? Do you see God, oh, oh I messed up, we got to hit the reset button. It's just simply not in the Bible. It's not found anywhere, nowhere at all. Now, they admittedly get their influences from what we would call Zoroastrianism. Um, it's Kabbalism. It's an occult. It, this is Assyrian mysticism. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud had a very heavily influence on this. I mean, the Babylonian mystery religions, which are pagan, they have influenced this culture, and so they've, they've intertwined it with the Bible today. Let me give you another one. Now, don't get mad at me. This is the Schofield Reference Bible. Some of you may have one of these, and some of you may be carrying one now. If so, I'm not going to call you out. But I want you to understand the errors that are in this so-called study Bible and the sources of where it comes from. Schofield himself had a, quite a controversial history. Um, he preached a varying gospel. In one place he says it's by works, and in another he says it's by faith. Those that funded his project, I would call into question being Freemasonic lawyers, which is a, an antichrist religion. Schofield attacks this also. And, and let me just show you on the introduction page. In section 11 of his introduction, he says, let's see, he says, well, first he says, we decided to use the authorized version, the King James, because the revised version obviously wasn't taking over as the most popular Bible out there. So because the Revised Version, the Catholic Bible, isn't the most popular, we decided to go with the King James. He says, the discovery of the Sinaiticus manuscript, which is the one full of errors, missing stuff, they were literally ripping pages out of it and burning it when it was discovered. He says, the discovery of the Sinaitic manuscript and the labors in the field of textual criticism, he also is a creation critic, of such scholars as Grease Bach, Lachman, Tischendorf, Trigellus, Weiner, Alford, Westcott, and Hort. So where did he get his doctrine? Well, from Westcott and Hort. Schofield actually traveled over to England to specifically spend time with Westcott and Hort before he created his study Bible and released it in the early 1900s. He spent much time studying with these guys that were, they created the Hermes Club and the ghostly guild. Now listen, you guys are supposed to be Bible-believing Christians. If you said, come on, Brother Fannin, we're going to start a ghost cult, and you can be part of it. I'm going to say, you know what? You need to read your Bible. I'm not interested. That doesn't sound right to me. That is not of the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a lying spirit, right? And I know, I know uh, uh, um, Halloween's right around the corner, but somebody's got to preach against the ghosts, okay? So uh, don't get involved with that mess. He goes on, he says uh, that they have um, that, they, that all of these things that he learned, it says, have been placed in the margins of this edition. Although I couldn't use the revised version, what I did is I put the notes in the side, but he also put it above and below. I want you to see this. In the introduction, here's Genesis. Now this is what's crazy. He has three and a half verses here. All of this is introductory notes, and all of this is critical notes. The Scripture has really been reduced. It I mean, it takes you longer to read the notes than it does the Scriptures here. I'm telling you, the creation account 
is being criticized. It's under attack, okay? He tells us in the introduction up top, it says, it speaks, in Genesis, he says, it speaks of the new birth, the new creation, whereof all was chaos and ruin. Wait a minute, that sounds just like this other Bible from 80 years earlier. Where, where did this come from? It's pagan doctrine. He tells you in line with the scriptures right above Genesis 1.1, he says, the original creation. Below Genesis 1.1, he says, earth made waste and empty by judgment. So he's adding his words in line with the word of God, saying that his opinion is on par with scripture. Now let's look at the notes. He tells us, the first creative act refers to the dateless past. I want you to remember that phrase because you'll hear it elsewhere. And again, for the sake of time, I won't cover everything I want to this morning. He says, for the, the first creative act refers to the dateless past and gives scope for all the geologic ages. He goes, evolution. Who said that? Was that you? Yeah. This is, the, this is called theistic evolution. That's what it is. Well, we can't answer the scientists. We're afraid to try to put science against science, so we'll just say, maybe it is evolution. Maybe God just stretched it out over billions and billions of years. They're acquiescing, they're compromising to worldly antichrist scholars, so-called. The first creative act refers to the dateless past and gives scope for all the geological ages. It clearly indicates that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as the result of divine judgment. Did you guys see that in Genesis 1-1, that it clearly indicated that the earth was remade, that it was destroyed, judged, and remade? Did anybody see that in your Bible? No. we got a problem here. He says, the face of the earth bears everywhere the marks of such a catastrophe. Now, was there a global catastrophe that changed the face of the earth? What's it called? The Great Flood. Amen. Brother Doug talked about it in Sunday school. We're all related to that first Adam. And you know what? We're all related to Noah as well. We have a common ancestor. And it's not an ape, okay? It's Adam and Noah. Uh, he, he goes on, he says, uh, this was a previous testing and a fall of angels. He says, uh, neither here nor in verses 14 through 18 an original creative act is implied. I want to spare you some of this because I don't want to overload you with information. I'm a nerd. I love the facts. It just shows me like, wait a minute, we have a problem because now in Baptist churches through the Schofield Reference Bible, we have Babylonian mysticism where they tell you, well, Genesis 1, there's a gap where Satan ruled for thousands of years or billions of years. We don't know. It's countless ages. And then God destroyed that and he started over with us. That's not what the Bible teaches. Day one is those first five verses. Now when you get to the verse five, if you'll look at it in your Bible, Genesis 1, 5, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. You either believe that or you don't. If you don't believe that, then you are a critic of of the Bible, you're a critic of Christ, you're a critic of creation. Schofield had a lot of theological problems. I'm only touching on this this morning. His notes for verse 5, the use of evening and morning may be held to limit day to the solar day, but the frequent parabolic use of natural phenomena, wait, 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 what? Parabolic? He says it's a parable. When Jesus wanted to teach a doctrine, he would also often teach a parable, yeah. a symbolic story to help us understand. Genesis 1, verse 5 of the first day is not symbolism, it is truth. It is not a parable. He says it's parabolic use of natural phenomena may warrant the conclusion that each creative day was a period of time marked off by beginning and ending. Uh, there's more he says, and again, I don't want to go down the rabbit trail, but I want to challenge you on this. The Schofield Reference Bible is wrong. I'm just going to flat out say it. Many churches I've grown up in, it was like, if you've got your old Schofield Reference Bible, turn to such and such, page 1051, amen, you know. And I've been in churches where they sell it in the back, even though the Bible says not to sell anything in the church, right? So I I've got some problems with it. 
I've, uh, generally speaking, I encourage new Christians to avoid footnote Bibles because there's usually something wrong. Somebody's putting their opinion in. I have other footnote Bibles where they have the creation record right and there's good information, but they have salvation wrong and that's kind of a big deal. So why would I give that to a new believer and cause confusion? Schofield changed a lot. And again, remember his intro page. He said he went and sought out West Cotton Hort and he put their notes in the sidelines. Let me give you a quote from the Church of England bishop. His name was Brooke Westcott Fort, Hort. I'm sorry, Brooke Foss Westcott. He says, no one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. This guy didn't believe Jesus is the Son of God. And he says, you can't read Genesis and believe that's the creation account. Well, how about Hort? He was a Cambridge University professor. His name was Fenton John Anthony Hort. Here's a quote, but the book which has most engaged me, now his most engaged list, like he said, hey, what's your favorite book? I need a book to read. What would you recommend? He says, my most engaged book is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. The guys that are listed in the Schofield Bible that changed the Word of God, that changed the creation account, they said Darwinism is unanswerable. Oh, I'm proud to be a contemporary working alongside with him. What? To teach evolution. It's wicked. It came into our churches. It's called theistic evolution. Another man, Clarence Larkin, he used the same revised version of the Bible, a Catholic Bible. He spake of Westcott and Horp. They taught, he caught, taught what was called a chaotic earth. That between Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it was all chaotic. God destroyed it. It was renovated. It was restored. And he said that the people that died back then, now they're demons today. And they're just trying to find a body to inhabit. This is bizarre, satanic, mystical doctrine. It doesn't come from the scriptures. No, not anywhere. Now again, Genesis 1, 1 tells us in the beginning God created. You either believe that or you don't. He tells us in verse 5, this was the first day. You either believe that or you don't. Do you, are you Bible alone? I am a Bible believer. Now, I have a problem with the footnotes. I have a problem with the concordances. I have a problem with the false prophets that would attack the creation record. I've got a big problem with them because I believe the Scriptures above all that. And I want to encourage you to be the same. Believe what you see, what you read. It's of the Word of God. God created everything in six literal 24-hour days. They're not parables. They're not symbols. It was six days. And that was about 6,000 years ago. Now, in day number two, He created the sky and the space. He created the stars and he created the oxygen. We see this in verses 6 through 8. Look, he says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made a firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. He created those other two heavens right there on day number two. The next few verses, 9 through 13, he creates the dry land, he creates the seas, the grasses, the seeds, and the trees. We get seas now. That's somewhere for the fish to live. We get the sky has been created and the oxygen that the animals are going to need, but they're going to need something to eat. So God created the food before he created the animals to eat the food. Again, God does everything perfectly and in order. Um, then in day number four, we see he created the sun, moon, and the stars. Now, I want to point out, as God had too many times, we do not worship them. We don't worship them. There have been many famous people that they wait for the alignment of the stars. Does anybody know of the most famous president that worshiped the stars? Reagan. Ronald Reagan would not do anything unless the stars were aligned. He was all about the horoscope and cosmology, 
He would put off speeches until things lined up. And he said, no, wait a minute. Don't you do that. Reagan's my hero. And he said good things about the King James Bible. I know, I know. But you know what? No man is perfect, but the Word of God is perfect. And he was superstitious about the stars. God warned us, don't worship the stars. The sun didn't make you. The moon didn't make you. The stars didn't make you. The Lord Jesus Christ did. I want to point something out in verse 14 if you look at that. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Right here is when God really tweaks his clock. And he says, you can look up and I'm setting every day in the sky. And in fact, I'm setting every year in the sky. And I'm setting the seasons. We're entering into harvest season right now, aren't we? And guess what? The stars kind of indicate that to us. But more important than that, he said the signs, the seasons, the days, and the years. Did you know that God set in his stars signs for certain times? There was a sign at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you this, there will be a sign in the sky at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be unmistakable. You're not going to say, oh, I don't know what happened. You're going to say, whoa, that's of God. Here he comes. Look out. It's exactly what he said. Doesn't he say in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that when he went up in clouds and he said that he would return in like manner, He's going to come back with clouds in the sky as a sign just as he left. So day four, we have the sun, moon, and the stars. Now it gets interesting. Let's look at day number five. Day number five, we see that God created the fish and the fowl. He tells us this in verses 20 through 23. Let's read it. Verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. I want to point out here, this is the, the first mention of the word life. The trees don't have life like the animals do. And the animals don't have souls like man does. But this is the first mention of life, and he also says living. He says uh, that every moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven, that's the sky. Notice how he defined that different heaven there. He calls it the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth with the waters which brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. It's interesting here that God also is providing reproduction. God wants us to reproduce. God made the animals to reproduce. This is part of his plan. Now, it's interesting, he made these creatures here, and they'll become food by the time we get to Genesis chapter 9. Okay, I want to point that out. All right, they will become food for us very soon. Now, day number 6, let's look at verse 24. God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle in the creeping thing, Beast after the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So here he makes all of the animals, living creature, which will become food for us soon enough. We've got to get to Genesis 9. It doesn't start out that way, interestingly enough, okay? Verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image. Now, God does not have a split personality per se, like a human might. However, there are three that make one, right? Uh, these three are one. We have the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. These three are one, and we are made in His image. The Father said, My soul is well pleased. Well, the Father represents the soul. He, uh, it says that He hath prepared Him a body. That's the Son. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We're made just like God. We're made in His image. And uh, God knows what He's doing. So when He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I also want to point out when it says man here, He does refer to mankind. He's not, uh, you know, 
man means both uh, mankind, so ladies as well included here, because he uses the word them. Look at it. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God gave them dominion. He creates authority and power and structure in this verse. Verse 27, so God created the man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God made man and woman on the sixth day, it's the same day. We get uh, a glimpse of that in the next chapter. We won't work, look there right now, but I just want you to understand. Listen, listen, God made man. There's no other option. God made man, and that was Jesus. And Jesus made us, and you know what? Jesus saves you. He redeems you. He judges you. He'll resurrect you. There are things yet to happen that He's going to do, and we must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We live in a time where believing that man was made by God, the world, in all their foolishness, doesn't believe that. They want to criticize us for believing that God made us. No, we came from a toad, a tadpole, a, a monkey, a chimpanzee. They'll believe anything. We came from a rock, from a tree. They'll believe anything other than God. And this is very important because when you look at creation, it really demands an answer of you. You see that everything is intelligently designed and created just like you. If you've ever made something with your own hands, wow, that took skill. I mean, everything, I mean, everything that we've made as human beings, it took work to get there, didn't it? Yes. We had to create it and put some thought into it and some design and some follow through and we learned some lessons. I mean, just making the light bulb was quite an adventure and how many were, were mess ups until we finally got it right. Well, God got it all right the first go around. He's perfect. You have to believe that God made male and female. And here's the thing, guys, listen. Male and female is designed to be a team. It says two become one flesh. You guys are teamwork. And I know we live in a broken world. Oh boy, I know it. But listen, I want to speak to you that are not yet married. You need to stay pure for God. You have one you are one, and there's that perfect one for you. And you don't go out and take your body and just test drive to strangers. God, stay pure for that one that God has you for. Amen. God will honor that. We shouldn't divorce. We should stay married. And you say, well, we live in an imperfect world, and I'm already divorced. I'm sorry to hear that. But you know what? If you're married, stay married. Don't divorce again. Just honor the Lord with your life and recognize that that's a pattern of His perfection, that He created the two together on one day, and He called them man. He called both of them Adam. When we got married, my wife and I, and they, they, they dropped her first name and called her Mrs. Adam Fannin. And I thought, yeah, that she's an Adam too. All right, you know. God has a perfect plan. It's all right here in Genesis 1. Here's another interesting thought, and I'm sorry that it even has to be said, but in verse number 27 it says, So God created man in His own image, in the image of God created him, uh, male and female, and does her, hermaphrodite, does your Bible say that? No. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Transvestite, I'm sorry. We live in a time when people want to tell you you can be whatever gender you want. Yeah, I can change my driver's license and say I'm a tree or a dog or make up some new word. And uh, I mean, it's bizarre how crazy things have gotten. The infection of sin has gotten into our minds and our hearts and Satan is ruling in the lives of people out here and they're training up children to be perverts, to abuse them and hurt them and just destroy their heart and their mind. And time after time you have these people, they're given drugs that affect their body to make them not what God made them, and it messes with their mind, and by the time they're teenagers or adults, they're ready to commit suicide. They're so confused. What a curse. There's two genders. Everything else is confusion, it's perversion, and listen, it's a filthy abuse agenda. Some wicked pervert wants to, a man wants to dress like a woman and wants to come read a perverted story to your children and tell them they can be like him? God has words for people like that. Listen, and here's what it is. Here's what it is. 
The family is under attack, period. The family is under attack. And if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you need to defend the family. You need to hold it to the highest standard, and you need to fight for your family, and you need to tell your in-laws that they need to fight for their families and uh, stand up and be a man, dad, and lead the household like you're told to. Lead them spiritually. And mom, do what God said and follow Him. And you two work together. As you get closer to God, you get closer to each other. We live in a time where everybody's selfish, and there's always some distraction on the phone taking you away from your family. And it has to be said, listen, fornication and adultery, those relationships outside of marriage, the Bible said, is a sin unto death. Amen. I know there's people, oh, I messed up one time, I'm so sorry. Well, get it right and stay pure now. If you're pure now, don't mess up because that is a sin unto death. And people get addicted to that lifestyle and it destroys them. And it's a sin unto death in the Bible. And I'm not saying we're going to get you. I'm saying God may just curse your life if you refuse to get it right. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God is commanding you to have children. This is the first commandment given to man. Before he said, don't eat of that tree, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Reproduce. Now here's the thing about multiply. When he says replenish, if I had a glass of water and I poured it out, we need some more water. If I had two bottles of water and we poured them both out, we need at least two more to just break even. We need four to multiply, don't we? One plus one is one, but... One, help me out with my math. I got to take my shoes off. All right. I always joke. I say, when it comes to complicated math, I can only count to 10 after that. I've got to start counting on my toes. I got to wear flip flops or something. Right? Uh, but, but when you get uh, two times two is four, and you're like, if you have four, that's multiplication. God's will is you would reproduce yourself and replenish the earth and refill it and then train those children in the fear of the Lord. And explain to them why you are who you are despite your own weaknesses. You say, but let me tell you how good God is and what His plan is for you. We live in a generation where mom and dad and grandma and everybody, they just leave it up to the world. Here, here's a cell phone. Go watch some social media influencer tell you what's important in life. God forbid. Mom, dad, Tell the next generation that God wants them to get married and have children and go to church and read the Bible and preach the gospel and live for Jesus because Jesus saves them. I mean, we have to teach this pattern. This is so important. If you noticed, I, I put out there on the sign this morning. Who, who saw the sign this morning? Yes. Just about everybody. Who wants to tell me what it says? Unborn lives matter. Unborn lives matter. Unborn lives matter. You know what matters? Every life. You know what matters? Lost lives that haven't heard the gospel. Let me tell you something. God's not a racist, and neither am I. He made all nations of one blood, and I understand the connotation with that other group. And it's not just about black lives matters. It's really about the homo agenda and the perverts out there. But uh, this isn't a political sermon, but I want you to know this. God tells us in the Bible that every baby matters. And He tells you to reproduce yourself. God is love and God created life. And I do believe that unborn lives matter. When he says be fruitful and multiply, he said it's in your nature. I've made it where you want to reproduce. The problem is we go against nature and we use our body ways. We're not supposed to use it. And we use our mind just looking at things that we're not supposed to look at. Then we get all messed up and we live a filthy lifestyle. God doesn't want that. He says God forbid, not in a Christian household. And I have to tell you, birth control pills, it's murder. Birth control pills, it's a silent abortion, and it kills babies in the womb. And God's not pleased with that. I remind you when we started, I read Exodus 20, where he says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. He said in Exodus 31, 17, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. 
Guys, I just want to encourage you, Satan is after your Bible. He is, he's after Genesis chapter 1. He's after Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created, he hates that, the heaven and the earth. God created the heaven and the earth. And eventually he got to it in a few days. He created the first man and the first woman on the sixth day. And you're related to them. You have a soul. If you've not yet trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you will end up in the devil's hell. But God is so merciful and long-suffering, it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, please just take the free gift by faith. Trust in Him. Don't harden your heart. Don't stiffen your neck. Don't reject the Bible. Don't reject the creation account. There's only two Bibles when it really gets down to it. You either believe the authorized version, what we commonly call the King James Bible today, or you have a Catholic version, and the creation account is under attack. The Gospel is under attack. We, we dealt with that a couple weeks ago, how they change it into works, and uh, they, they delete very important verses. I want to give you great assurance in this. God loves you. He made you for a reason. You're not just some random being floating through the universe without a soul. No, you will last forever, and you're in the Lord's army. He has a plan for you. Listen, not everybody is infiltrated. Not everybody's a sniper. You're in the army. You've been drafted. God has a plan for you. Find out what it is. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word, and thank You for telling us of this simple creation account. Lord, I pray that you would increase our faith and help us to trust in you. And Lord, I ask that you would give us the spiritual strength to rebuke anyone that would reject it or mock it. Lord, you created male and female, and that's it. And Lord, I thank you for, your, for everything you've done. I thank you for your salvation. Lord, I pray that you would bless our time this afternoon as we go out soul winning. Lord, help us to see someone saved for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.